WordPress Accessibility Day 2023, Understanding Color and Contrast Requirements in WCAG 2, with speaker Jonathan Whiting, Director of Training, WebAIM, recorded on September 28, 2023. All right, we're at the top of the hour. All right, so um, welcome everyone who uh, who is new here um, for this session, um, or if you've been here, um, welcome back. Um, and this is WordPress Accessibility Day 2023. My name is Jason Ferreira, and in my day job, I'm the Accessibility Lead for Consumer Products at Dow Jones, but for today, I will be your host. Thank you all for joining us for Understanding Color and Contrast Requirements in WCAG 2 with Jonathan Whiting. A little background on John. John is the Director of Training at WebAIM. His main passion is helping others learn to make the web more accessible to people with disabilities. With a master's degree in instructional technology and 20 years of experience in the field of web accessibility, Jonathan has published dozens of articles, tutorials, and other instructional resources. He has traveled extensively to train thousands of web developers and other professionals who develop or maintain web content. Before I pass it over to you, John, one last uh, bit of housekeeping. Um, attendees, please feel free to add your questions in the Zoom Q&A section, and we will answer them at the end of today's session. Please use the chat to connect with other attendees, to chat amongst yourselves, and uh, use the Q&A for any questions that you would like John to address at the end here. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Jonathan, and uh, we'll get started. Great, thank you, uh, Jason, for your, the intro. I'm going to get my screen share going here. Put a couple things around, just move my picture out of the way. All right. Uh, thank you so much for that intro. <clears throat> I'm just going to dive right in because we've got a lot to talk about. I, I don't know, kind of don't know what I was thinking trying to cover all this in 40 minutes, but I'm going to do the best that I can. Uh, just at the start, uh, we did just get, uh, actually, Jacqueline just put a link into chat. Uh, for a page with resources that are related to this. Now, I'm not going to be sharing the slides, and that this might make more sense as we go through. These aren't really slides for sharing. There's a lot of accessibility issues that need to be explained and talked through. Uh, but what I, I do want to share is a page with uh, several related resources. So uh, just articles on how to make content more accessible, articles on really what we're going to talk about, and some tools that we're going to be using as well. I think this will be kind of a more useful page to refer to afterward, as opposed to my slides that are really just kind of talking points and, and a lot of visuals. So with that, um, I just want to start by saying at a very high level, we're going to talk about two, primarily two principles. I'm going to talk about just making sure you've got good contrast in the things that you create, and I'll talk more about what I mean by that, and, and not relying on color. So these are these two main principles that we're going to talk about. And to talk about all of that, I'm going to try to, for the most part, stick to a single example. So I've got a question, and feel free to type into chat. Uh, and here's the question. I've got up here, and I'm going to just describe it a little bit. I've got a checkbox. It is a custom checkbox. I've got a label with a link in it. So the labels, I've read and agreed to the terms of use. The, the terms of use is the link. It's uh, not underlined. And so just maybe any, any guesses how many color and contrast checks you would have for this example right here. If you were to evaluate this on one of your pages. So I'm gonna, I, oh, and I, can people chat for it? Yeah, I thought so, okay, good. So we got three, uh, three, five, uh-huh. This is great, I really appreciate this. I'll give just another second for a couple more guesses. Excellent, like three, four, perfect. Okay, that is just about the average. Most people do say three to five. The reality is it's 15 or more. And you're like, wait, what? Really 15 or more? And, and I'll explain why that is. But yeah, there, there's a lot. There's a lot of checks. A lot of times when I'm evaluating a, a page, and that's part of the work I do, I primarily at, at WebAIM focus on training, but I do evaluation work as well. And there are often times where I spend, I don't know, almost half of my evaluation time just cataloging issues related to color and contrast. So there is a link in that resource page to a blog post that, that enumerates those 15. We're actually going to go beyond that, time permitting. Uh, to talk about why and, and, and why, why that number so high will make sense hopefully pretty soon. So I'm, I'm not going to talk too much about the web content accessibility guidelines as a set of guidelines. Uh, just within the guidelines, there are 
uh, these numbered requirements called success criteria. And there are a few that I'm going to talk about, the three in some detail, uh, and briefly touch on a fourth one. Now, I'm going to start with a requirement related to contrast. Now, there are levels. If you're familiar with the success criteria, they have levels of single, double, or triple A assigned to them. So this first one with minimum contrast is a level double A requirement. And so, so just a little bit about that requirement. There's a phrase that, that uh, gets used a lot, and I, it's not even an incorrect phrase. People talk about color contrast. Then it's true. Color is an aspect of contrast as, as we perceive it. Uh, different color combinations uh, can, can impact just the perceived contrast of colors. Some things are, are more legible. Invert them and maybe one, one or the other is going to be more legible for you. But the reality is in the, these guidelines, in the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, and I'm going to say WCAG a lot, W-C-A-G, uh, they actually don't talk about color contrast. What they talk about in WCAG is luminance contrast. Well, and what that means is it's not about the colors you choose. It's about the brightness difference between these colors. Uh, the term that's the full term that's used in these guidelines is relative luminance contrast. So what does that mean? Well, what it means is the way our screens work, we're really seeing three colors. Uh, you got black, and then you got three colors that are presented: red, green, and blue. And pure red is, is pretty hard to read when it when it's used on a white background. Pure green is also pretty hard to read, maybe even maybe brighter and harder to read than the blue. I've actually added a little outline. I just, I'm trying to make my inaccessible visuals a bit more accessible uh, by doing, you know, with a few little techniques here and there. But that red and green is just, it's, it's kind of hard to, to see. And so what is found within these guidelines is a fairly complex formula to try to weight these different colors. And don't worry about the formula. It's just a slide to say, look, all, look at all this math. It's pretty much what's going on. But uh, what it does is it weights the red and the green and the blue that are used and, and just kind of looks at the brightness of those and creates a ratio between two colors. Now, the highest this ratio uh, can be is 21 to one, and that's black and white. Uh, and doesn't matter if it's black on white or white on black, it's that same ratio. And that's the case with all of this. Um, if you, in, well, I guess invert isn't the right word. If you swap those colors, uh, the ratio is still the same. Now, this is a lot of contrast and not always, the highest isn't always best, um, a lot of black and white can be kind of jarring. Um, so what is within WCAG, within these guidelines, is a minimum level of contrast. And it's 4.5 to 1 according to that formula. So the first couple checks that you're going to have to do, one is for the, that main text of I have read and agreed to the, so the not, not link part of it, just kind of that label text. Uh, and that would need 4.5 to 1 contrast with its background, which in this case is a white background. Uh, the second check is going to be the, the link text. So that also needs 4.5 to 1 contrast with, the, with its background. Um, so there are, again, we got a lot to talk about. I, I'm going to really demo some things fairly quickly, but I'm going to talk about a few tools to help with testing of contrast. Now, there are a lot of great contrast tools out there. Now, I'm, I'm going to talk about the ones that, that we have at WebAIM. They are available for free, but I'm going to point out a couple of WebAIM tools. Uh, and so the first one is going to be a tool called WAVE. Now, WAVE is a free evaluation tool. It's available at wave.webaim.org, and there is a link to that within the um, evaluation tools section. Uh, also available, and I'm going to kind of show what WAVE does in just a second, but we also have browser extensions that allow you to install this evaluation tool on Chrome, Firefox, and Edge. So that's what I'm going to use. Uh, when I demonstrate this, I'm going to use, just give me one second, I'm going to come to this color and contrast practice link uh, in this page. I'm gonna make sure to put this back at its normal default size, and then I'm going to use Wave. Now, because I've got this add-on installed, it's going to, uh, I'm, I have this little Wave W icon in the upper right corner, of my uh, browser window here. So I'm gonna use that. And Wave gives me a lot of information about a lot of accessibility things, errors uh, for alerts, features, just things that it, it wants me to be aware of and, and test a little bit more deeply. Uh, but don't have time to talk about most of Wave. I'm just gonna focus on one thing that it will do and it will report contrast errors. So I can click on uh, in this Wave sidebar, I can click on the contrast tab 
And there are a couple of these icons telling me that there's some text with very low contrast. There's a, this gray on white that has a just under 4.5 to 1, 4.7 to 1. There's also this button text. It's like a gray on lighter gray button, uh, also with low contrast. Now, this text that in the middle between these two icons, which says, does this larger text have enough contrast? It, it actually has. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to just take one second. It actually has the same level of contrast, um, but it doesn't show up. So uh, the, the reason it doesn't show up with an icon is because there is one other rule to be aware of. And let me say it a little differently. There is no there is no error. Same color, but this larger text, no error icon. That's because there is one other rule to be aware of in, uh, in WCAG, uh, and that is contrast of large text. So if you do have text that's a certain size or larger, the, the, the requirement goes down. It goes down from 4.5 to one contrast down to three to one. The idea is if it's bigger, it's bigger on screen, you just have more of it to read. It doesn't need as much contrast to be perceivable. And so uh, the requirement for the, that three to one, that starts at 18 point text. Now in pixels on the web, that's gonna be 24 pixels. If that text is bold, uh, 14 point or 18 and like two thirds pixels. That's that three to one contrast requirement. So, um, so that's why using this tool in Wave, and, and there's some other tools we'll talk about, um, that's why there is no error here because even though this text has the same uh, color, because it's large enough, uh, it, it needs at least three to one contrast. So it's not a WCAG failure. And Wave does detect that. It looks at the size and weight of the text uh, to do this. Now, it's not gonna detect everything. For example, I do have some text that's on a gradient background. Uh, so this is image. It's a background image as well. I think, I can't remember. I think I used a background image here, or maybe it's just a color gradient, but it's still, Wave, wave isn't that smart. Uh, and so the, we will talk about some other ways to test contrast, but that's those are those first couple of checks. Gonna be the, the label text and then that link text. Okay, so that's, Two, one and two. Number three has to do with non-text contrast. So there's a requirement. It's the number is 1.4.11, uh, but this requirement called non-text contrast, also level AA, deals with things that aren't text. Um, just take one, one little sip of water. All right. So uh, in this case, because this is a custom checkbox. Now, if I'd stuck with the the kind of built-in. Uh, native, you know, kind of browser built checkbox, no customization, I wouldn't need to check this, but because this is a custom checkbox, I would also need to check to see that the checkbox has uh, at least three to one contrast. Uh, now, what parts of the checkbox? Well, right now we're focusing on that border because that's the part that I need to be able to see to know where I put my mouse or where I need to navigate to with the keyboard. That's, that's the, it's like inside here, you can check this thing. And so that needs to have at least three to one contrast. Um, so that is the third requirement here. And we'll talk about a couple other things related to non-text contrast later on, but that's, but that's three. So number, oh, sorry, I had a little, a little order thing there. Let's, uh, uh, I'm gonna just jump onto this use of color, which is gonna give me my fourth check right now. So another requirement, and the number for this is 1.4.1 if we're keeping track, uh, and it is level single A, but this requirement is called use of color. Now there's two important things related to this. Um, a lot of times what comes to mind when people talk about use of color is don't rely on color, like red and green for pass and fail and things like that. And that's true, but there is another, and, and we're gonna come back to that, but there is another important uh, way that color can be used. Uh, not just, sometimes it's requiring that someone can distinguish a certain color. You know, I can see red. I can see green, but sometimes color is used to, to distinguish an element to like differentiate it from something else. And it's not so much the color you're using, it's the difference between colors that's giving you information. So a common example of this is a link. We have this link here uh, in the screenshot and I've tried to kind of add some borders and, and a few things just to, I don't want my own slides to have con uh, accessibility issues. I don't want to rely on color in my own slides. Um, so I've kind of try to put a border around this. 
Um, but this terms of use is uh, it, because it's not underlined, because it's just a color difference that's being used to, to tell me that's a link, this would fail that requirement. One of the things it says that you cannot do using just color, you can't rely on color for distinguishing a visual element. In other words, this isn't body text, this is a link. Uh, you can't rely on just a color difference for that. Um, so let's talk about that. I'm going to talk about that requirement a little bit more, just focusing in on the, the difference between this link text and the label text here. Um, so that you get this. And, and by the way, these colors that I'm going to use, these are colors that are pulled exactly from a, a pretty, like a Fortune 100 company that we worked with. And these are the colors they were using for their links. This is the process we went through. I'm kind of talking about this with them. And uh, so at first of all, you might think, well, no, those colors are pretty different. They're actually not. Um, there actually is very little. OK, the colors are different, but the brightness difference between the two is, is actually not a lot. The, the, the contrast difference, uh, they're almost the same. Uh, some people do have difficulty distinguishing uh, gray and blue text. I've talked to a couple of people uh, who told me that and shared that experience. And so if someone can't maybe has difficulty distinguishing gray and blue, this is a screen kind of a, a slide kind of trying to simulate what that might be like for that person in terms of use, while very slightly different, it's really hard to distinguish that. In fact, uh, if you're just reading through lines of text, even if you have good contrast sensitivity, I think you're going to have a hard time picking out the links. So, uh, so that is kind of just give you an idea of that issue. Now, when we were working with this uh, client, they said, well, what if I just bold this? What if I use uh, bold to distinguish this link? And so let's see if I were to pull out the color and just look at the, the contrast difference there. That definitely does uh, work, right? You now have distinguished your links using more than just color. However, that only works if you only use bold just for identifying links. And that's almost never the case that with this client, with a lot of other people we've worked with on this, issue, at some point they use bold to emphasize text. So you might say, well, I've read and agree to the terms of use, or you must do this, or it's just anywhere in that nearby text, you bold something to emphasize it. Well, now you're back to relying on color, uh, and, and now you're back to failing this requirement. So that's a kind of a workaround that just doesn't work most of the time. Okay. So that, and actually this is a question I, I'm, that I noticed just popped up in Q&A. So does, the, does this meet this criteria of colors used and the link is underlined when hovering a mouse over it? So I'm gonna come to that. Um, before I do, I just wanna say, let's underline our links. Um, I, you know, I think that's gonna be best practice. Not all links, not all the time, but where they're appearing next to other non-link text, body text, um, like just makes them better. Um, it makes them, I think, more usable, more mobile friendly, more scannable, um, easier to track a link across line breaks and things like that. And so there's just a lot of good reasons to underline your links. Um, but, but so what's required? And this actually, I think, goes to the question that, that um, Beatrice asked. And that is, uh, so you've got this, you've got the, not just the contrast requirement, but what if the link is underlined when hovering the mouse over it? So that on its own doesn't meet this requirement but it is a part of meeting this requirement. So you, you must, if, if you aren't underlining those links, there are two requirements. One is that there is a three to one contrast ratio between the link text and the non-link text. And the idea with this is, well, if you give it enough of a contrast difference, now you're not relying on someone being able to differentiate colors, you're, you're allowing them to just differentiate the contrast, just tell the difference between, well, this text is lighter or darker than this other text. Um, and so, uh, and we're gonna use a tool in just a minute to show how you can do that. The second part to this though, is, is kind of related to what was just asked. The link must present a, a change, a, a non-color cue. So more than just a color change. And that typically means bringing back that underline uh, on keyboard focus. We, it actually isn't required for mouse hover uh, because the idea with mouse hover is, well, you're already hovering with your mouse. You already have a pointer there. The, if it's a link, and this is this is by the way just for links. It's not for buttons or other things. This requirement it, it just specifically calls out links. It's kind of kind of weird, but um, but it does 
it, it, when you hover over a link, you also get that cursor change, right? It changes to that finger. And so technically it's not required, but it's a really, really good idea. If you, if you are gonna bring back that underline, bring it back for the hover as well. So let's use this, this contrast checker. I'm gonna go back to this uh, page. Let me refresh this page. I'm actually gonna make it a bit larger. So we do have a, a link here, come, kind of moving down this list. This I've read and agreed to, and this time it says copyright in terms of use. So these are the same colors as was used in that slide. So if I wanna test this, I can use a, a link contrast checker. Okay. So this link contrast checker, what it does is it adds another, another option. When I was using Wave, I had these two options for color. I had uh, a slider for the text color and a slider for the background, or uh, options for the text color and background color. This one has two different text options, link and body text. So with link and body text, uh, I, I've pre-populated this with the two colors that I've been using. So it's a, a blue that does have at least 4 to 5, 4.5 to 1. Uh, you've got the body text that also has at least 4.5 to 1. So the link and body text pass on their own the, the non-text, I'm sorry, the text contrast requirement. However, there, as I mentioned, they have almost no contrast difference between them. So if I don't want to underline my links, I'm going to have to use a different color. Now, I can't really go lighter. Because if I go lighter very quickly, way, well, well before I meet that three to one difference between link and body text, very quickly I will get too low of contrast text. So if I, in order to have three to one difference between the blue and gray, I've got to get that so light that it only has 1.5 to one contrast. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the way I did that using this link contrast checker, by the way, and other contrast checkers, is that there is a, a lightness slider. And that just kind of tries to change the, the lightness and darkness of that same hue or color. So that's not going to work. Um, neither is going lighter with the gray. So you, what you need to do is go darker with one of those colors. I think it'd probably make the most sense to go darker with that gray. Otherwise, it basically look like you've got black links you know, by the time it's dark enough. Um, so dark gray text with that same color blue for the links, this would now meet that requirement. So that's something that I can do. So I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm keeping Q&A open. I'm going to try to answer some questions as I go and hopefully still keep a couple minutes at the end. Um, so there was a question about adding an ARIA label. And I'm going to lump that all into kind of one category of um, making this accessible for screen readers. And this is not about uh, blind users or screen reader users. This is about uh, sighted users. So the thing with the ARIA label is that that would help me, and maybe some other techniques might help me if I'm using a screen reader, but a screen reader is actually already gonna tell me it's a label. So this is purely a visual thing. This is really just about differentiating colors. And so the ARIA in this case, you're not gonna be able to add anything with ARIA labels or anything else that would address this. It would really have to be at the level of the colors you choose. Um, so then another question from Megan, a really good question. And that is about uh, if, if there's different requirements, the link is standalone. So you give the example, uh, Megan, in your question, maybe of like, uh, like navigation. So on this page with the link contrast checker, we do have some navigation links at the top to the five main sections on, uh, the, on the WebAIM site. And they're not underlined, right? Because they, 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 they're clearly presented as links. Again, this is about the visual presentation. And uh, if, if I can't perceive color, I'm still gonna know those are links, regardless of my, you know, what, regardless of the color perception or contrast sensitivity, uh, I'm still gonna be able to tell. And so, yeah, good question. That would, would not need to be underlined. Or if there's other styling, uh, sometimes you got links that looks like, look like buttons and they're, they're links under the hood and you've made them look like buttons and you no longer have those underlined. That's another example in the question. That's fine too. Really, this is about just not relying on color as the only way to present that. So yeah, thank you for the questions. And if you keep those questions coming, some I'll, I'll probably hold off and answer at the end, but some, if it seems helpful to just answer them while I'm going, uh, I'll do that instead. Um, so hopefully that maybe helps with how I could use this tool to get the, the, ne the necessary color 
or really contrast differences uh, with these colors. Okay. All right. So here's a, a kind of a slide showing what that would be like. We got that much darker gray that's getting a lot closer to black. Uh, and then we've got that contrast that's going to give you what you need again. But if I underline it, just look how much more obvious it is um, right off the bat that that's, you know, that that is a link. So that's just a little bit more about the kind of that idea of relying on color uh, and, and why it's important to, to not just do that. Okay, so we're only up to four. Like we're halfway through our time, we're only up to four. How's that possible? Well, the reason that's possible is because numbers five to 15, most of them kind of fall into the same category. And that is, you've got to interact with the thing. Uh, it's, there are only a, a few things that you can that you can detect just at, at, at a glance or using tools like Wave. A lot of it has to do with the interaction that happens because you need to consider the contrast of things in different states. So if I have this custom checkbox and I hover over it, and say it changes from gray to blue, uh, or if I have a link, and when I hover over that link, it gets lighter, as an example. Uh, well, now those are, are different states where the contrast has changed, and I'm going to need to test that. So that's a lot of these. Five, six, seven, eight, they're all different states of that checkbox border. Hover, focus, active, checked. Now, some of these are, are just super fast tests, right? If I'm hovering with my mouse and something doesn't change, or it gets lighter, I'm sorry, or, or it gets darker. Well, I don't need to, I, like, I don't need to dig deeper with that. I don't need to pull out other tools or techniques. I, you know, if it has enough contrast and it gets darker on the, on the background, it's, it's going to have, it's going to have more contrast. So some of these are like one second checks, but it's important to do this. When I interact with this thing, when I, when I check it, uh, if I, when I follow a link, does it, not, you don't have as many sites with this anymore, but if it has like a, so, sorry, transitioning to the links. Uh, it doesn't have like a visited state. Um, you know, hover, focus, active, visited. So that's a bunch of these. 9, 10, 11, 12. Hover, focus, active, and visited for my link. So that's how that number gets so big so fast. Okay, so there's a question in the related resource section. Um, so let me go back to this page real quick just to clarify. Really good question, a good catch. Uh, I have uh, like a few links in this page. Only one of these examples is not underlined specifically for this activity. There are some others that are underlined. And so, um, wait, sorry. And maybe Leanne, I'm actually not sure if I'm totally following the question. So so where, where it's clear that these are links. Um, oh, I'm sorry, actually, I know what you're saying. So we've got this related resource uh, section. So we've got a few things that are very clearly presented as links. So how about the non-link text for some of these though? Like uh, for each of the articles, uh, I've added a little, just a few words to describe what that article contains and that's not a link. And so, so yeah. Now, if for example, in my related resources, it gets a lot closer, but I even there do have a couple of separate links. So at the bottom, I've got a link to, the WordPress accessibility plugin. That's about the only thing I'm going to say about WordPress in this WordPress accessibility day. But it's got it's got a link and then non-link and then the name. And so it's two separate links. And so so that's kind of the idea there. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Leanne. I finally tracked that that question. Thank you for that's a good question. Thanks. Um, so so you would still need to, in this case, underline those links. Now there might be places where that's not the case. For example, there might be some pages where we have a list of related resources. They are always just links and they're called related resources. And you could maybe make a case for not underlining those. And, and I'm talking about a sidebar that we have in an article that I just clicked on. So yeah, there, there might be times where that's not needed. Okay. Good. I'm going to got a good question coming. I'm going to hold off on that one maybe till later. So 13 and 14 are now we're going to be talking about not just the color of something, if it changes color on focus, but whatever indication you have that something has keyboard focus. So uh, this focus indicator, 
I've, I've used a blue outline as an example, where if I hit the tab key and navigate to something with the, with the um, keyboard, I've got this outline. So that's going to be number 13 for the link. Number 14 is going to be for the checkbox. Oh, yeah, Joe, Joe mentioned in chat. I didn't, yeah, he didn't, he didn't, I, I just, a little plug for that. It does have a contrast test, testing, I think, built into that plugin. Um, and Joe, you can correct me on that if I'm wrong, but I just, it is a useful WordPress resource, absolutely. Um, so, uh, a little bit more on focus. Of all of these different states, it is by far the, the trickiest because the thing that sets keyboard focus apart from all these other possible states is that you're actually not just, uh, you're, you're, you're relying on whatever change, it could, that it, let me say that differently. The change actually does direct you to that thing. When I'm hitting the tab key, the whatever change I get on, on focus, that's how I know that thing has focus. With a mouse, I know because my mouse is on it. I get a cursor, I get a finger, something to tell me my mouse is on it. Well, with focus, I need, that is how I know. And so there's some additional things to be aware of here. Um, so if I just changed color between uh, my, these different states, I've got a gray default, a blue hover, and a green focus uh, border. Now I'm not recommending these colors. I'm just, you know, just for examples. If I were to do that, the hover would be fine because there'd be a three to one difference here. The focus though, there'd actually be a problem here. And it would probably be a failure of Wokeg. Uh, now it gets it gets kind of technical and tricky here. It's actually a failure of the color re requirement because I'm back to relying on color. Uh, I'm back to relying on color for a place where where only color, like if I'm using a keyboard, it's only a color difference that would tell me that I've navigated to that thing. So so that's a requirement uh, that you need to address. Now this is probably one of the tr funkiest things that I want to talk about, and I hope I can explain it in the time I've got. You've got, if you add, say, like a little light gray border to uh, a checkbox uh, and between the hover and focus states. So you've got gray default, blue hover, and then just this light gray little glow on focus. It actually passes uh, all of the requirements in WCAG at levels A and AA up to version 2.1, which is the current version. And there's kind of this weird gap where in the, the contrast one, it says, well, you need at least three to one contrast for every state, but not differences between states. And in the color one, it says you can't rely on color alone, but it doesn't have a minimum contrast. So there's this weird little gap where this little subtle glow, even though it's very light and has less than three to one contrast, wouldn't fail anything in version 2.1. So there is a version 2.2. Uh, and, and I've got the text here, but actually in the interest of time, I'm not going to read it all. It's called focus appearance. And what it basically says is it's not enough just to, what, it, it fills that loop, that uh, gap. So if I have the, the gray box as my default, that blue box with the light gray glow as my focus indication, that would fail this requirement. Um, because the difference between these two, there's, it doesn't have three to one contrast. Another thing that would fail is a very narrow border. So if I've just got like a one or under a two pixel, say outline or something like that, if it's really, really thin, um, you know, uh, like I, I made it slightly bigger than one pixel just so you all can see it, but uh, it, it would also fail just because the indication is so small that it might be hard to perceive. But if I did say darken the checkbox, the checkbox is much darker. And now the color difference between of the borders is at least uh, three to one, that would actually pass because now I've got this big border, at least two pixels, and that border uh, has at least a three to one contrast difference. The glow actually no longer is even relevant. Uh, it's just that it's big enough and it's different enough that it would meet this requirement. Now, even better, give it a, a focus outline. Almost always add that keyboard focus outline um, because it works with all of your states. Sometimes you end up getting places where you get more than one state at the same time. Let's say, um, now this is kind of a weird scenario, but maybe I've, I've hovered over something with my mouse while I'm tabbing along with my keyboard. I just kind of put my mouse over something. Uh, I, if I've given that an outline, and that outline is at least two pixels, and that outline has at least three to one contrast with the background, then I've met all of these requirements. And so that's going to be best most of the time. Okay. 
to a little water rate. So if we've got to evaluate all these states, and if it's like, you know, two thirds of, of the things that I've talked about in terms of numbers, um, how do I, how, how can I do that? Well, there's several ways that I can, can do this, but one is using uh, dev tools or Chrome developer tools. There are similar contrast tools in other browsers, but I'm going to focus in on Chrome and their developer tools. There's an article that goes through this. So I'm going to go fairly quickly, but if you want to maybe learn more about how to do this, just please go back to the article that's linked to on that resource page. But I've got a scenario here now where there's a contact us link. And when I come to this contact us link and I hover over it with a mouse, or if I navigate to it with a keyboard, it actually, well, actually, no, in this case, it's just the hover state. I misspoke. It, it gets lighter. So that lighter text, uh, I, I don't know if that has enough contrast. So with DevTools, there's some cool stuff that I can do to just to save time. Keyboard shortcut that I use all the time is Control Shift C on Windows and Command Shift or Command Option. I think maybe even both, but uh, I think it's Command Shift C on, on Mac, and it will open this developer tools, and it will also open this mouse inspector. Now, this tool is mouse only, but what I can do is I can hover over different elements. And one thing it'll do is it'll actually tell me the contrast, which in this case is 4.8 to 1. So it's over that 4.5 to 1 requirement in its default state. Now, if I wanted to test that hover state, uh, I can, in this developer tools, I've got uh, kind of the bottom half, I've got these different tabs. The first one that's selected by default is styles. Uh, right under that styles tab is this button. It's, it says it, HOB is what the button says. It's called toggle element state. And if I come into this toggle element state, I expand it by clicking on the button and I check the hover state. It actually will lighten this text. I should have lightened the text. I, I, you know what? I didn't inspect the right thing. Let me do that one more time. Got to make sure I'm on the, the right thing. I'm on that link. I'm going to hover, change, toggle that hover state. And now if I inspect this, it has three to one contrast, it fails this requirement. And so developer tools can be really useful to, to lock in these states when I know I need to do a little more testing. Okay, I know we're kind of flying through these. Um, sometimes I'll take like three hours on these topics. So going kind of quickly, but again, hopefully just the principles make some sense and then dig a little deeper with some of those articles. Okay, so, Number 15 is actually an easy one to overlook, uh, but that is, well, what about the check mark? So I've actually, it's in this checked state. Um, I need, what is the indication that this thing is actually checked? A check mark. I've got to test the contrast of that and make sure that that thing has contrast as well. So I'm up to my 15, but wait, there's more. There's actually more than these 15 because if I look at this thing, I have read and agreed to the terms of use. Basically, every time this appears or something like this appears in a form, it is required. And so if you have something that's required, what are you going to end up with? You're going to end up with error, error messaging, submission of that thing, error states, that kind of stuff. So this is kind of the bonus round, kind of the lightning round. You're probably thinking, wait, it gets, it gets faster. <laughs> but um, this is going to be a little bit on the more than those 15. What if this thing has an error? So uh, I've, I've got this, I've read and agreed to the terms of use and there's this submit button, but it has really low contrast. Um, that's a visual indication that this thing is, is uh, disabled or inactive, that I can't click on it, right? So I might try to click on it and nothing's gonna happen. If I try to navigate with the keyboard, it's gonna jump past that thing because it, it, can't, it can't get keyboard focus while it's in that disabled state. Um, so you might think, well, what do I do about that? That fails, right? It actually doesn't fail because there is an exception for inactive components because the way you know something is inactive or disabled is that it's low contrast. Um, but this is not an ideal way to do this. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure all of us have had this situation where we're, where we're like, why can't I submit this thing? Why can't I click this button? And then you realize, oh, I missed some required thing somewhere else up the form. I didn't even realize it was required. Um, I think better is usually to allow submission and then provide error feedback, error messaging. So we got this button. The submit button is now is no longer disabled. So I'm going to click it and, and I will get some error messages. So now I need to test that. So number 16 is going to be contrast of the button border, right? I ask in a leading way. 
Actually not. Because the idea with, why, why not? So I said I needed the border with the checkbox, but not with the button. Well, that's because with the checkbox, I need to know that my mouse or goes inside that box. That's the border of the thing that I can check. With a, a button, it's not. Um, so it's it, you don't actually have a contrast requirement for that border. So how about the fill of that button? Actually, not even the fill. The fill of a button, you don't, it, there's not a requirement that that have, let me, let me say it differently, the fill with the background. Um, does that need at least, you know, three to one or, or something like that? It, it does not. Um, the idea with that is, well, we've all seen buttons that don't have uh, a background at all, and we still know where to click. Uh, we, you know, now submit's not usually, it usually looks like a button, but sometimes it might be a different color, or you might have like a, a you know, a reset button or something that it, that it doesn't look like a button. Um, so what do I need to really test? Well, the contrast of the button text. So that would be this like dark gray text on this light blue background. That would be the contrast that I would need to test. And I'm, I'm actually, you know, thinking, wow, you're kind of stretching for some of these numbers. I'm actually going to kind of walk it back here and I'm just going to leave it at 16, but you'd actually would need to test all the other possible states of this button as well. So it's actually going to be 16 plus, closer to 20. Um, but let's say I submit this thing and I've got an error. And so now with this error, I've got a, a checkbox uh, that's now red. So a couple things with this red checkbox. One is that I now need to test the contrast of this thing. So does it have at least three to one contrast with the background in its error state? So I've introduced an additional state uh, now that this thing has an error. Uh, so that's one, that will at 17. Uh, and then what about the difference between the error state and the focus state? You know, so before I saying, well, okay, we got that black or really dark checkbox, got this bright blue focus indicator, I'm good to go, right? Well, what, what if there's an error? And now it's because really it's the it's the difference you're looking for is between the unfocused and the focused state of that thing. And when it's got an error, the unfocused state is now red. And so I failed again, unless I would have added maybe that. That's another reason, another plug for adding that outline. Um, so, that, so that's that one. And then probably the big one here is you've got color that's prompting a response. So with this color prompting a response, uh, that's going to be a, a use of color failure. And you might say, well, wait, I thought I had at least three to one contrast like the link text. Well, this is different. The reason this is different is because you're not just saying, here's a color difference. You're actually using the color red to convey meaning. This requires that I can detect and, and, and differentiate the color red from all other colors. And so even if this has enough contrast, this would still be a failure of that use of color re requirement because I got to know what red is. I got to be able to not know what red is. I got to be able to see red and tell it apart from others. So what would I want to do? Maybe I'd want to add like an icon and some kind of a, an alert in addition to that color uh, to let me know that there's an error. Then that's great. Um, now, this would be something that I'd also need to test the contrast of. Okay, so one, one little aside here with this contrast, and, and, and that is uh, I've used a white background for all of these slides. Um, often I'll see a form, for example, or maybe even like this bottom part of the form where it's like a lighter gray. When it comes to testing contrast of shapes, it's not just, it's not always just two colors. Uh, the term that's used in, in WCAG to describe this, the, the contrast requirements is that it's against adjacent colors the parts of the shape that I need to perceive in order to know what's going on. And for an alert icon specifically, a triangle is part of that shape. Now, if it were a circle or a square or just an exclamation mark, fine. But because I've decided to use a triangle and that is a, a symbol for an alert, really I have now, I have to, to test really the white contrast from the red. And if that has at least three to one, I'm good. And in this case it does but the red against the gray background does not. Um, it has less than three to one. And so that this would actually fail that because there's this triangle, I need to perceive or, or, or distinguish the triangle from the background. One way I could address this is to add a border to the icons. If you do that in general, to the little icons you're using like that, and then you can be confident that they'll have enough contrast uh, on any color background. Okay, so we're real close. We're almost done here. Just going to wrap it up with, with one final thing, and that is 
uh, an error message. So what if I add an error message? You must agree to the terms of use to continue. So one final thing related to graphics is that you need to have that three to one contrast if the graphic is required to understand what's going on. If it's just if it, it's if it's an enhancement, uh, and in this case it's become an enhancement, there's no contrast requirement. Um, now it's great that it's there, and I would definitely recommend it. But the error message on its own is enough to tell you that there's an error here. Um, you just it, it appeared, it wasn't there before. Uh, you must agree to the terms of use to continue. It's it's its own. You know, it, it tells me that this is in an, in an error state. So in that case, I would need to test the contrast of the error message. I would still recommend, highly recommend a good high contrast alert icon, but it wouldn't on its own, that, that would be uh, not required. So we're, we made it. <laughs> I know that was, that was pretty quick. That was about as fast as I know how to go with this. Um, but that just gives you an idea that we're actually up to 20 and really even more with that button that I threw in, um, different things that you would need to test. Um, so just be be mindful with your contrast testing. I think the big key is interact with that thing so that you you interact, figure out what are its different states, submit things with errors so that you can test the errors of those as well. And, and I think those are going to be the real keys to really bring those, those checks up, the number of those checks up pretty quickly. Okay, so, so we are at the end. Thank you so much. And, and I'm going to go back through a few questions. We've had about five minutes, uh, four minutes remaining for questions. Uh, but just, you know, thank you so much. And we do have the link to the, that WebAIM uh, resource page. We have a lot of other resources on the WebAIM site, discussion lists and newsletters and, and uh, you know, info about the services we offer. So with that, I'm going to stop my share and just uh, take a look at these last couple of questions that came in. Um, yeah, so one thing uh, Beatrice asked, uh, it really is that the test is really foreground and background of text. And so I'm kind of skipping around. The question is, do we need to perform contrast tests with, uh, with the background of the overall page? Absolutely. Um, so I used white kind of as a default for these, but it's really going to be whatever that background color is. And it's very often not white. It's going to be some other color. So yeah. Um, Okay, so uh, Gary asked that question about uh, not relying fully on color or contrast and also using ARIA attributes. Uh, I would say, I think a key to the question uh, that you asked, uh, Jerry or Gary, is uh, definitely uh, also, also ARIA attributes. Yeah, we just, this is everything, all we've talked about 100% has been about the visual experience. And you would definitely want to enhance that experience using ARIA to make sure that somebody knows, for example, it's in an error state has that error message read, um, but that would be in addition to all of those color and contrast requirements would still be in place regardless of, of the ARIA that you're using. Um, <clears throat> avoiding placement of text on gradient backgrounds is generally best practice. Yeah, I think so, or, or busy images. I mean, sometimes a gradient can be quite subtle and I think that's okay, but very, you know, a really pretty significant gradient or very busy background images. The question, I, I'm sorry, I'm not doing a great job reading my questions. Would you say that avoiding the placement of text on a gradient background is generally best practice? I think in general, unless that gradient is, is pretty subtle. Um, are there color palette resources that we're not really calling colors that will help set up a theme so that all the colors will work in any state the use at the beginning? Absolutely. I think having colors, palettes, and parts of style guide are really useful. Um, I I can't quite remember the link to one or two tools to kind of help you with color palette building. If anyone knows of one that they want to share in chat, that's great. I mean, you can definitely use tools like the, the contrast checking tools that we talked about with, within WebAIM to determine what are some of those colors and those differences. Um, and I can't off the top of my head think of a tool that, that kind of helps you with that color palette building. And then last question, usual workflow when deciding on color styles for a website, what tools or checks do you typically rely on? Um, so yeah, thank you. Someone mentioned, I think Adobe does have a, 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 a tool. And then there's a couple that are being added into chat for that last question about palette builders. Um, so this final question, sorry, and I, I wanna just reread it real quick. Thank you for sharing that, but, um, oh, dang it. 
Jason, I'm sorry. Could you remind me on that last question? I, I distracted myself. Oh, sorry. Um, this last one. Uh, I think it was just about workflows and processes. And I think for that one, um, the, the process is typically going to be uh, testing contrast in its default state using tools like Wave um, and then uh, using, and then a really a big part of it becomes the interactions. And I think that can be done one of two ways. Either remember that while you're testing interactions, mouse and keyboard and things like that, remember to always test contrast with those interactions, or I will often just, just do my contrast testing. So it's like, okay, default, focus, hover, error, active, you know, all the different states and just kind of, I, I, I think it's a lot easier to cover my bases if I do those all at the same time. Um, so I think we're at our time. So thank you so much. If I can, I'll type answers to these other questions as I go. Oh, if, if there are any other questions. Yeah, I think I think you wrapped them all up. Um, thank you very much, John. That was a great session and you took care of all the questions for me, made my job really easy. Um, so um, yeah, thanks again. Um, and thanks for everybody for attending this session with uh, Jonathan Whiting. Uh, you can continue the conversation on social media using the hashtags WPA11Y day and hashtag WPAD2023. Uh, we'd also very much appreciate it if you go to 2023.wpaccessibility.day slash feedback to provide anonymous feedback for our speakers and on, uh, on their presentations and enter. And while you're there, you can enter to win a t-shirt. And that about wraps it up for me. Uh, thank you all so much for attending, and I hope you learned some really great accessibility tips and tricks and get a chance to use them on your sites. Um, and thank you uh, to WordPress for giving me the opportunity to host some really great sessions. Um, and with that, I believe I'm passing it to Joe. Thanks, everybody. Thank you to WordPress Accessibility Day 2023 sponsors. Platinum sponsor, Equalize Digital. Equalize Digital's Accessibility Checker plugin is an automated accessibility scanning tool that helps WordPress websites become and stay accessible. Platinum sponsor, Gravity Forms. Gravity Forms is the professional form builder that you need to create beautiful, powerful, and accessible forms. Gold sponsors, 20i, DQ, Empire Caption Solutions, Pressable, and WP Engine. Silver sponsors, Code Geek, Drake Cooper, GoDaddy, Lone Rock Point, NerdPress, Overnight Website by Kinetic Iris, Riola Networks, A11Y Collective, and The Blogsmith. Bronze sponsors, Accessicart, Green Geeks Web Hosting, Hall Analysis SEO Consulting, HDC, ITX, IvyCat, Metabox, Pixel Chefs, Simply Schedule Appointments, SiteGround, Termageddon, Underrepresented in Tech, Weglot, and Yoast.